Hello, you're watching Hornbill TV's top stories of the week. Starting off, the NDA today held a mega rally and campaign for PDA's consensus candidate Dr. Chumben Muri in Chumkidima's Agri Expo. The campaign was graced by BJP National President JP Nadda, who urged the crowd to vote back NDA to power. Naglin Chief Minister Nifi Rio, Deputy Chief Ministers Wai Patton and TR Ziliang, along with several leaders from the oppositionless government of Naglin, were also present at the election campaign program. All the leaders, while addressing the crowd, appealed to the voters to cast their votes in favour of Dr. Chumbin Muri, who they said is the right candidate to represent Nagas in the parliament. Earlier in the week, Naglin Minister for Public Health Engineering and Cooperation, Jacob Jimomi, during the People's Democratic Alliance's Lok Sabha campaign for its consensus candidate, Dr. Chumbin Muri, in Newland, said Naglin is one of the most mature states in India and its statehood represents a prestigious identity for the Naga people. All the 16 districts of Nagaland are special category districts, Jumomi said. Political leaders from the Nationalist Democratic Progressive Party and the Bharatiya Janata Party and community leaders attended the event. In his address, Jacob Jumomi said it takes both the government and the public to bring development. Referring to the Eastern Nagaland issue, he mentioned the central government's working paper to the state government for the development of the eastern areas. He appealed to the people to cast their votes for their respective representatives to address and represent their grievances. A special court in Gwalior in Madhya Pradesh on Friday issued a permanent arrest warrant against former Bihar Chief Minister Lalu Prasad Yadav in a case related to the alleged illegal purchase of arms and ammunition in 1995-1997. Mahendra Saini, Judicial Magistrate First Class of the Special Court set up to try MPs and MLAs, issued the permanent warrant against Lalu Yadav. Special Public Prosecutor Abhishek Merotra told PTI. The case of 1995-97 relates to the arms being purchased from an authorized dealer hereby using fake documents. There were 23 accused in the case, which was registered at Indraganj police station, and all have been charge sheeted. Of these, Yadav has been declared an absconder, he said. As per the prosecution, the permanent arrest warrant was issued as no one appeared in court on behalf of the RGT leader. When contacted, Jabalpur-based MP High Court lawyer Rakesh Pandey said a permanent arrest warrant is issued after the bailable arrest or non-bailable arrest warrants are served, but the person doesn't present himself before the court. Under bailable and arrest warrants, the court sets the time limit for the accused to appear before it after serving orders to them. It is not in the case of a permanent arrest warrant. The accused has to be produced in the court when arrested, Pandey said. Yadav, who was convicted and jailed in the former scam in Bihar, was released on bail in April 2021. Globally, India termed the UN Security Council resolution that demanded immediate ceasefire in Gaza for the month of Ramadan a positive step, asserting that the humanitarian crisis resulting from the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict is simply unacceptable. We are deeply troubled by the ongoing conflict in Gaza. The humanitarian crisis has deepened and instability has been increasing in the region and beyond. India's permanent representative to the UN, Ambassador Ruchira Kamboj, told a UN General Assembly meeting on Monday. She said India views the adoption of a resolution on March 25th by the UN Security Council as a positive step. Kamboj said the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas has led to a large-scale loss of civilian lives, especially women and children. The resulting humanitarian crisis is simply unacceptable, she said, adding that Delhi has strongly condemned the deaths of civilians in the conflict and it is imperative to avoid the loss of civilian lives in any conflict situation. The UNSC resolution adopted last month demanded an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, respected by all parties, leading to a lasting sustainable ceasefire. The 15-nation council adopted the resolution, put forth by the 10 non-permanent elected members of the council, with 14 nations voting in favour, none against, and an abstention by the US, a permanent member. Even though the complete data are in the public domain on the Election Commission's website, the State Bank of India has refused to disclose the detail of the electoral bonds under the RTI Act, claiming that it is personal information held in a fiduciary capacity. RTI activist Commodore Lokesh Batra approached the SBI on March 13th, requesting the complete data of the electoral bonds in digital form, as submitted to the Election Commission following the Supreme Court's directive. The response furnished by the Central Public Information Officer and Deputy General Manager of the SBI said 
It said that the information sought by the RT activist is containing details of purchases and political parties and hence cannot be disclosed as it is held in fiduciary capacity disclosure of which is exempted under sections 8, 1, E and J of the RTI Act. Batra had also requested information regarding the fees paid by the SBI to senior advocate Harish Salve for representing the bank in its case against the disclosure of electoral bonds records. The bank cited that these records are held in fiduciary capacity and that the information is personal in nature. Batra expressed his dismay, stating that it is bizarre for the SBI to deny information that is already available on the Election Commission website. Regarding Salve's fee, he highlighted that the bank refused to disclose information concerning taxpayers' money. Supreme Court, deeming the electoral bond scheme unconstitutional and manifestly arbitrary, instructed the SBI on February 15 to provide comprehensive details of the bonds purchased since April 12, 2019 to the EC. The EC was then directed to publish this information on its website by March 13th. The EC published the data furnished by SBI on its website on March 14th with the details of the donors and political parties that redeemed the bonds. In some international news, real estate tycoon and billionaire Trong Mai Lan was sentenced to death on Thursday by a court in Vietnam's Ho Chi Minh City in the country's largest financial fraud case, according to local reports. Lan, 67, was accused of fraud amounting to $12.5 billion, nearly 3% of the country's GDP in 2022, as the chair of the real estate company Van Thin Path Holdings Group. Lan reportedly controlled the Saigon joint stock commercial bank illegally between 2012 to 2022 to siphon off funds amounting to 304 trillion dong equivalent to 12.5 billion dollars through thousands of ghost companies and by paying bribes to government officials. Lan's arrest in October 2022 was among the most high profile in an ongoing anti-corruption drive in Vietnam that has intensified since 2022. From early 2018 through October 2022 when the state bailed out SCB after a run on its deposits, Lan appropriated large sums by arranging unlawful loans to shell companies, investigators said. One of her lawyers said Lan would appeal the verdict before it was issued. The trial, which began on March 5th and ended earlier than planned, came as part of a campaign against Graft that the leader of the ruling Communist Party, Nguyen Phu Trong, has pledged for years to stamp out, although with few tangible results. The crackdown dubbed Blazing Furnace has seen hundreds of senior state officials and high-profile business executives prosecuted or forced to step down. The campaign has touched the highest echelons of Vietnamese politics. Former President Vo Van Thong resigned in March after being implicated in the campaign. At one point in 2022, Vietnamese stocks suffered a 40 billion wipeout following a series of big corporate arrests, rattling investor confidence at a delicate moment for the fast-growing economy. In some unfortunate news this week, six students were killed and many others were injured after a private school bus they were traveling in overturned in Kanina town of Haryana's Mahindra Gar district this week. One of the victims stated that the driver was drunk and overspeeding. District collector Monica Gupta said that treatment of the injured children is going on and the rest are all out of danger. The government is providing them the best possible treatment. She also said it has come to the notice that the private school in question was running even on a holiday and action will be taken. There was also a lack of documents in the vehicle, so an FIR is being lodged against the school administration as well. Haryana Education Minister Seema Trika, who came to the hospital to visit the victim, said schools should not be open during holidays. A show cause notice has been issued, and apart from that, the school has been asked to provide an affidavit of the transportation vehicle, saying that the vehicles function according to the transport rules and norms. She said if the driver was found drunk, then the school's schools shall be held responsible. Leaders across Haryana and the country expressed their grief over the incident. Haryana Transport Minister Asim Goel, meanwhile, said a high-level committee will probe the incident and an FIR will be registered against the school. He also said in March, a final rupees 15,000 was imposed on this school bus due to incomplete papers. The negligence of the school is very clear in the case. A fitness test of all school vehicles will be conducted in the state. South Korea's Liberal Opposition Party won a landslide majority in the country's general election to retain control of parliament. The Democratic Party and smaller opposition parties jointly won 192 of 300 seats in the National Assembly. The vote is widely seen as a midterm referendum on President Yoon Suk Yeol, who had three years left in his office. 
His party leader Han Dong Hoon resigned and Prime Minister Han Duk So has offered to resign. This was a crushing defeat for Mr. Yoon and his People Power Party, which had been struggling to achieve its agenda in a legislature dominated by the DPK. The DPK's win means they will be able to fast track and push legislations through parliament. Both the DPK and PPP used breakaway satellite parties to maximize their vote under South Korea's electoral system, which assigned some seats to smaller parties whose seat counts fall short of their overall support. This isn't the Democratic Party's victory, but a great victory for the people, said DPK leader Lee J. Myung on Thursday. Politicians on both sides of the aisle must pool our strength to deal with the current economic crisis. The Democratic Party will lead the way in solving the livelihood crisis, he told reporters. The result could embolden Mr. Lee, who narrowly lost the 2022 presidential election to Mr. Yoon to make another presidential run. Mr. Yoon is under pressure to address a number of issues including rising food prices, a rapidly aging population and an ongoing doctor's strike. And in some success story, the man who planted an IED at Bengaluru's Rameshwaram Cafe on March 1st, as well as the mastermind who planned the blast, have been arrested by the National Investigation Agency from West Bengal. The absconders in the Rameshwaram Cafe blast case, Abdul Mateen Taha and Musavir Hussein Shazib, were traced to their hideout near Kolkata and were apprehended by the NIA team early morning on April 12th. The NIA was successful in tracing the accused who are hiding under false identities, an NIA spokesperson said. Shazib is the accused who placed the IED at the cafe, and Taha is the mastermind behind the planning and execution of the blast and subsequent evasion from the clutches of the law, the spokesperson said. National Investigation Agency has been granted a three-day transit remand of the two prime suspects, Abdul Mateen, Taha and Musavir Hussein Shazib, in the Bengaluru Rameshwaram cafe blast case. The NIA court in Kolkata said on Friday. The arrested accused will be taken to Bengaluru on the transit remand. The NIA had arrested the duo near Kolkata. Shazib was the one who placed the improvised explosive device at the cafe and Taha was the mastermind behind the planning and execution of the blast. The two accused are residents of Thirthahali area in Karnataka, Shivamoga district. On March 1st, a blast at Rameshwaram Cafe in Bengaluru's Whitefield injured nine people. Following the blast, the Karnataka police identified a suspect in the CCTV footage who used an IED device with a timer to carry out the explosion. The NIA took over the probe on March 3rd. The NIA had arrested Musavir Hussein Shazib and Abdul Mateen Ahmed Taha from Kolkata for the alleged role in the Rameshwaram cafe blast case. That left 10 people injured. And those were the top stories of this week. See you next time. Goodbye.